Welcome to the Unconventional Dyad Podcast, where psychology and psychoanalysis meet social justice, feminism, politics, climate change, critical theory, graduate student mental health, and the arts. Your hosts are Carly and Laura, two graduate students and friends committed to bridging the gap between the field of psychology, social issues, and society. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Unconventional Dyad podcast. We are on part four of our internship mini series today, and we are going to be talking about the ranking process when it comes to internships. This process for us was a little confusing, so we hope that we could help illuminate um, the difficulties that we've had and maybe help you along the process as well. Yes, absolutely. So, where do you want to start, Laura? Well, maybe it might be helpful to kind of start with an overview of how the ranking process works. I know we have to get like a match number. There's a bunch of different moving parts. So maybe we can just start with Mm -hmm. that. Um, So what happens is with the internship process, we use a national matching service. Um, And it's called, yeah, just National Matching Services Incorporated. And what you have to do as an applicant is to sign up for a number. Um, It's an applicant code number through the National National Matching Service Incorporated. Um, And you do that pretty much when you start applying for internships. Yeah, it doesn't have to be done right away. um, But before you are able to get matched, you do need this number. So it doesn't have to be done at the same time that you start your application process, but you do want to do it, um, you know, as as soon as possible. Yep. One thing that really caught me off guard is the cost to get a number. I was really surprised when I went to go pay for my number, it was about $130. So that is something that you're going to want to keep in mind. That's a pretty, it's a a big amount. So just be ready for that, for that cost to go on your credit card or however else you're going to pay for it. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, we couldn't find the exact number that we paid for some reason. This cost is nowhere to be found. So (laughs) just know that it's above $100. um, So you will have to dish out a little bit of money for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But basically, you have this code number um, so that when you go into the system and you rank all your sites and your sites rank you, there's a number to kind of match. Just like the sites have a number, you also have a number as an applicant. Um, And it goes into the algorithm and the algorithm eventually spits out, you know, your match. Mm -hmm. Laura, did you want to go over how we determined our rankings? Would that be helpful? Let's definitely do that. Um, Yeah, I actually started ranking my sites as soon as I went on interviews. So I kept like a running list, a running document that I edited after every interview, depending on my... um, just, yeah, what I noticed about the site, what my impressions were. And so I had a ranking list going into interviews. So prior to doing any interviews, I kind of had an idea of where I thought I might like some of these sites to be. But as I was going through the interview process, my rankings changed a lot. So a site that I didn't even have as my number one site prior to the interviews ended up being my number one site after doing an interview with them and with all the other sites. Um, So I like to keep just a running list and a document that I could just change on the spot. Um, I wasn't going to wait until the very last interview to start ranking because I knew I would kind of forget certain things about the site. How did Mm -hmm. you do it, Carly? I was really similar. I kept a running ranking as I did my interviews. And I also tried to take as good of notes as possible uh, during the interview. So our interviews were virtual. So I could actually have a notepad in front of me and taking down notes. I don't actually know if that's okay to do in person. I imagine it would be, but it was a little bit easier to do virtually. So just taking a few notes down. And after the interview, I reflected quite extensively Uh, quite extensively about the site itself, what I really Mm -hmm. liked about the site, whether I could see myself there. And I actually referred back to those notes as I was making my final ranking, which was really helpful. I actually forgot pretty big chunks of the interviews itself. Some of the days are really long, so you forget a lot of information. And 
So I tried to take as good of notes as possible. And then I referred to those notes when I was making my final decision. So I'm wondering what went into your ranking, Carly. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of elements did you look for when you were making your ranking list? That is such a good question. I... I didn't have too much of a problem doing my rankings. I Mine kind of fell out the way that it was really easy for me to determine where I wanted to rank sites. Mm-hmm. I, I was certainly going for fit. Um, cost wasn't a huge issue. I think a lot of the sites that are located in more expensive areas, the, the stipend was more. So it really, yeah. the cost itself of living didn't really play into my decision. So I really went for what was the best fit where I could see myself, where my interests lie. And to be completely honest with you, the interviews meant so much to me. You can get a sense of what type of people you're going to be working with, what the culture of the program is. The culture to me is just so important. I I don't want to be somewhere that, um, you know, is kind of cutthroat. And um, Mm -hmm. so the culture is really important for me. And I certainly considered that in my rankings. Absolutely. I think we're so similar in that, Carly. Number one for me was culture and and what kinds of relationships I could see myself building with people there. I got a pretty good sense of how people got along with one another. Um, I kind of like the virtual format because in the beginning of interviews, people just kind of gather in that, you know, virtual room and chat. And so I got to see how staff members and interns were interacting with one another. And that gave me a pretty good idea of what that site culture might be like. So for me, number one was culture. Mm -hmm. Would I enjoy being there? Would I enjoy the people there? Um, Obviously, I also cared about the kinds of opportunities and experiences that the site provided. But to be completely honest with you, I don't think I applied to any sites where the training didn't seem to be pretty excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's not like I had a site that had really poor training or really few opportunities. Um, I mean, there's some variation there, but that wasn't really a main concern for me. Um, My main concern was definitely the culture. Laura, did you have any experiences that uh, during the interviews that really shaped kind of more of a negative Mm. view of the site? Can you think of any instances where you're like, yeah, I really don't want to be here? And what might have that looked like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Yes, I think the sites that were very rigid, to me, were very unattractive. So there were sites that kind of went through their list of questions pretty rigidly, and um, didn't really take the time to get to know applicants more as like a human being. There wasn't any conversation or banter. That to me was a huge, maybe some people like that, but to me that was a a, a red flag. Like that's not the kind of environment that I thrive in. Um, So the sites that were a little bit more rigid, um, a little less friendly, I think ended up going towards the bottom of my list. Um, And then I also paid attention to the pacing. So were people giving the applicants breaks? Were they taking breaks in between interviews? Were they taking breaks to check in? Were there opportunities to network? That was really important for me because that kind of, I imagine that that's the kind of pace that you're going to be at at the site. So the interviews that I had that were one after the other with no breaks in between and they were super rushed and, you know, they had to be on time. That to me, again, was kind of a red flag. What about you? That is a good question. I had a few instances where interns actually were pretty honest about the site, which I very much appreciate. There was one intern uh, for a site that I was applying to that said, I really did not appreciate my experience here. I wasn't a good mm-hmm. fit. This is what supervision was like, and it didn't really suit me. So mm-hmm. that that certainly shaped my view of the program. And she was actually doing this with another intern who, who had a very positive um, mm-hmm. view of the program. So it was actually a really good experience seeing both the positive and the negative, but the negative that she was talking about, I think really was important for me. I think we ha- shared a lot of the same values. So I, mm-hmm. I ranked that site lower than, than I had it ranked initially. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you mentioned a good point too about supervision. That was something else I looked out for was what kinds of supervisors are there at this site and what are their approaches? I made sure to ask about specific approaches um, when I had an opportunity to ask questions. Mm-hmm. So I was looking for a supervisor who truly was interested in intern development. I think most people are who are, you know, in that kind of position, but there are some who, you know, maybe are more 
um, more dedicated to intern development and education than others. Mm -hmm. And so that also went into my rankings. Um, And I I would say that the site that I picked as my number one, definitely, I could tell they were all about intern development and growth. Mm -hmm. One more thing too, I had an interview that was really, really short Mm -hmm. and it was about 50 minutes. And I feel like I didn't get a really good view of the program. And I was really disappointed in the interview itself, but I was able to reach out to the training director of the program and I asked for the interns email addresses and I reached out to the interns and asked them what their experiences were. And it was actually really helpful. I I think I, if I wouldn't have done that, I would have ranked the site a lot lower, but after I got a chance to speak with the interns, I, I'm like, this is a great site. I can see myself being here. So I ended up ranking them quite a bit higher after I was able to speak with some of the some of the interns. Mm-hmm. I'm so glad you did that. That's a very good point. If you don't feel like you've gotten enough out of an interview to make a sound decision, I would definitely say reach out. I reached out to actually um, to an intern who I didn't really get. I, I got to talk to him a little bit, but he had to leave for a different meeting. And so he actually told me, you know, if you have questions, email me later. And I did. And I got a pretty thorough response back from him. And that also helped me in my ranking process. Mm -hmm. I also have reached out to other members of the training program that I didn't get a chance to speak to. And I mean, people are really busy, you know, people, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you email the training director, you know, recognize that they are really busy. But if you do have questions, I think it really is okay to reach out. I've reached out to other staff members at these training programs and the feedback that I have gotten from them has been incredible. So that is certainly okay to do that, especially if you have pressing questions that, that you really want answered before you make your rankings. All right, so why don't we go into the actual match process itself? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so th- there are a lot of issues here. Um, and yes. <laughs> we, we are probably going to miss a lot of them, and we can follow up in the episode notes uh, if we do yeah. find that we're missing missing things. One of the biggest issues that I found was the actual, when you're going into the program itself, so it's through the National uh, Matching Services Incorporated, mm-hmm. some of the training directors that are mentioned on those sites do not match with the actual training directors. And I was actually a little bit nervous because I'm like, wait a second. So this individual is the actual training director, Mm -hmm. but the, 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 the training director that was mentioned on the rank order list was not the same. So that is something to, to kind of keep in mind that they don't update this. I don't think as, as much as they should. Right. Yeah. So what you do is you have to search or add a program either by their site number, their code number, or their name. Like you can type in the name and search it that way. But it is tricky because sometimes the names in the national matching service um, list don't match with what was on your application. So the names of the sites sometimes might match, or like Carly was saying, the names of the actual training directors might not match. So you have to be really careful. Um, because you want to make sure that you're actually including the right sites that you actually applied to on your list. Um, so one way we did that was by looking at the match number for each site, right? Like we searched by, we both, I think, mm-hmm. searched by the match number of mm-hmm. the site because we knew that wasn't going to change mm-hmm. in any way. Finding this match number, though, is also really tricky. So the process that Laura and I went to to actually find the match numbers, you can go into the API application And to find the match numbers, you can go to your application portal and then click on program materials. And then you click on the site. And interestingly enough, the match number is found under the questions tab, which Mm -hmm. is why I couldn't find it initially. I was having a hard time actually finding the number. So once you click on the questions tab, the actual numbers are located right there. And it's really easy yeah. to find. So when you actually go into your, the matching service and you start doing your matches, you can use those numbers to find the sites. Yes. Yeah. And it took me a little while. Like it's easy to find once you know where to go for it, but there's a few steps involved in getting to that number. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do wish that was a little bit easier, but mm-hmm. it's doable for sure. Mm-hmm. Something else to consider, too, is that if you apply to different tracks or if internship programs have different tracks, you're going to use different numbers for each track. 
Yes. So, yep. So be sure to pay attention to the different tracks and make sure that you're ranking those tracks the way that you want them ranked. Yeah. I would also say too, when you're thinking about how to rank your sites, definitely just rank based on your true preferences, like where you would actually want to work, not based off of how you think you did on the interview or how you think the site is going to rank you or how you think the site is going to rank other applicants, like truly just look at it. Even if you completely bomb the interview, if that's the site that you want to be at, I would say rank that one number one. I know I've heard of people trying to play the system a little bit, trying to play the algorithm a little bit. There's really no way to do that because I think the algorithm from what I've seen in my research of it and watching videos on YouTube about it, it seems like the algorithm, it works in favor of the applicants, not necessarily in favor of the sites. So if an applicant has a site ranked number one, the the matching service is going to try to get the applicant matched to that. So the the only way you might not get matched to your number one site is if the sites either didn't rank you or if they ranked other people higher, much higher than you. Mm-hmm. Um, and those people potentially rank those sites higher. So it's it's a very complicated process, but truly believe that the algorithm is trying to get you to the site that you want to get to. So anything mm-hmm. else you do to try to play the system might actually not work in your favor. Mm-hmm. Can I mention one more thing really quickly about the ranking? Of course. So you can change your ranking up until the deadline. Um, Just know that. So the deadline for us this year is February 5th, which is this week on Friday. We're recording this on a Tuesday. So that's when the, the deadline is to submit your rankings. However, when you go into your rank order list on the National Matching Services website, you need to click Certify certify your list but that doesn't mean that you've submitted your list and it's not changeable at all you can actually change that list and recertify the list up until the deadline so it's okay to play around with it a little bit um, and don't wait until the very last minute going in there to Mm -hmm. certify your ranking list because there's probably going to be a ton of people Mm -hmm. on the server at the same time yeah, there was an actually there, there's a person a few years ago at our school who I don't think she actually got her rankings in on time because the server mm-hmm. was down. So I m- mine was done last week. Um, yeah, you, you certainly do not have to wait until the actual day to do your rankings. So if you have an idea of where you want to rank sites, go for it. You can always recertify it. You can change it around and recertify those rankings before the deadline. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. The time in between the ranking deadline and match day is about two weeks. So you'll make your your ranking and then you will be matched uh, for phase one if you if you get matched during phase one a couple weeks later. And that time in between can be really anxiety provoking for I mean, I think it will be for me. I'm, I'm already starting to experience a little bit of anxiety. And yes. Laura's passion, I think, um, and she can speak you know, on her own volition here, but her passion is self-care, especially with graduate students. So we thought it would be a neat idea and it may be a good idea to talk a little bit about self-care. Absolutely. Yes. Let me put in a disclaimer here. My passion is self-care, but I'm not, I'm still not very good at it. Oh, so I don't think either of us are. <laughs> no, we're not very good at it, but we're trying, right? So that's the important part. I do think self-care is extremely important, especially during this process. Like this process could not have been Well, it could have been more stressful, I think, but it was pretty darn stressful. Mm -hmm. Um, I am glad that we got some, you know, uh, opportunity to do this virtually because I think if I had to travel all over the place, I would have been much more stressed out. But it's a very stressful process. And so I really made an effort to take care of myself during this season. Um, One way I did that, this sounds really simple, but I have been making sure to try to get seven to eight hours of sleep every single night. That's a huge issue for me in general. Um, But letting myself go to bed at a certain time and wake up at a certain time every day has been a huge game changer for me, um, especially during this process. So I would say start with the basics, you know, make sure you're getting good nutrition, make sure you're going out to exercise. I would exercise before all of my interviews to let off some steam. That really helped. And make sure you're getting enough sleep. Um, I would start there, I think. And then aside from that, I mean, I am already feeling pretty impatient about having to wait. I also submitted my ranking list last week 
And I'm feeling extremely impatient and nervous about having to wait until, you know, February 19th for us to figure out where we matched. So one thing that I've also been really focused on is meditation. Um, This is not, you know, a sponsorship plug or anything like that, but I've been watching Headspace on Netflix. If you have Netflix, Headspace came out with like a meditation series and I put it on in the mornings or at night. And I really try to spend that time meditating um, and clearing my mind of things having to do with internship. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's been my go-to. What have you been doing, Carly, to help you through this? I think for me, I also have been really trying to disconnect a little bit. We are so saturated with so much information and, you know, social media, especially now that most things are virtual. I just sometimes get a little bit overwhelmed with social media, all the virtual sessions that we're doing with patients, classes are done virtually now. So really trying to make an effort to disconnect from technology. For me, that's really helpful. Um, I really enjoy going on walks. And I think that in itself is really nice just to get outside because again, everything is done indoors. Everything Mm -hmm. has to be done in a specific room in a specific place, um, at least for for sessions with patients and class and whatnot. So it's just really helpful Mm -hmm. to try to get out of that rut. I know for me, I am also getting very impatient. And so really trying to find ways to soothe myself um, and that can look a lot of different ways, but I've really enjoyed going for walks. Mm -hmm. It's been really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. I I would mention one more thing too. I've noticed that I have a tendency to, when I'm stressed out, keep myself busy with other things. And so I'm trying to approach this waiting period a little bit differently because what tends to happen is I think it's a good idea to keep myself busy and add more to my plate. So I'm distracted and I'm not thinking about the things that are really on my mind, like the matching process. Mm -hmm. However, Typically, when I do that, I just stress myself out even more. I become more overwhelmed and it really defeats the purpose and I don't feel any better. I actually feel worse by the end of the whole process um, than I would have otherwise. So I'm trying not to fill my plate with too much and I'm trying to focus more on doing things like journaling, meditation, Mm -hmm. walks, like you said. Mm -hmm. One last thing I'd like to mention is, and I know we've covered this in other episodes, but this process is extremely isolating. And that's one reason why Laura and I are are actually talking about this process is because we came into it not really knowing much of anything. There wasn't really a whole lot of information that was provided to us, and we kind of had to figure it out on our own. Mm -hmm. I don't know if other schools do, do it any differently or provide more information about this process, but the process itself is so isolating and people don't really want to talk about rejections that they got. They don't really want to talk about, you know, how their interviews went. So I would, I would recommend if this is helpful for you, really try to stay connected with others during this process. For me, it has been a game changer. I have used my support, uh, support group pretty extensively during this process. And so I would recommend if that's something that you're really needing just go for it. This is such a a painful, isolating process. And I don't want anyone to have to go through it alone because it is, it can be pretty rough. Yes. Such a good point, Carly. Thank you for saying that. And I think truly people want to know what's going on, but for some reason, there's this fear around this process where people don't feel like they can ask each other about how it's going, which is very odd to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm very grateful that I have you and some of our other friends from our cohort who are very open about all of our rejections, Mm -hmm. you know, all of the bad interviews or the good interviews, like Mm -hmm. sharing in the good news and the bad news. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people do want to talk about it. They just don't necessarily know how to. And that includes professors and supervisors. Like a lot of them will kind of hesitantly ask me, hey, how's how are things going? Is it okay if I ask you about this? And I'm like, yeah, of course, I want to talk about it. Um, you make such a good point, Carly, and thank you for bringing that up. I think support systems are key during this process. Mm-hmm. All right, is there anything else you wanted to cover before we end it for today? I don't think so. Not about the internship. Do we want to mention maybe some changes on the podcast with Zencaster? Yes. Okay. So as you might hear, we have better audio now and we are not sponsored by Zencaster, but we want to just say that this is a free recording platform. 
and it is incredible. It is absolutely incredible. The audio is great. And so it's, it's phenomenal. So if you all are interested in recording audio for really anything, class or whatever else, I would highly recommend looking into Zencaster. It's free. Yes. There are paid versions, but Laura and I don't make money for this podcast. So we do not have a paid version, <laughs> but even the free version is fantastic. And we really wanted to just share that because it's been such a relief to have audio that yes. actually works. No more crying, no more anger, no more frustration, <laughs> no more rage, no more calling, yeah. um, you know, these other platforms uh, rageful saying that our audio didn't turn out. Yep. Yep. No more not getting help for those problems. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it is really great. So you can record as you can hear, both of us are on the same platform at the same time. We're on Zancaster together. Um, so we're recording in real time together, which is very cool. And what I love the best about Zancaster, aside from the fact that it's free, is that it records separate tracks for each person. So you can actually take each track and put it together in the editing process. Um, and we were having issues with that because we were trying to record in the past on one track at the same time and if one of us had unstable internet or something happened you know with technology it would mess up the entire recording mm -hmm. so it's a huge relief to have two tracks that we can put mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. anything else you want to mention about the podcast I don't think so um just that I'm I'm really grateful for it I'm really grateful for the people who are listening mm -hmm. um yeah cool well, stay tuned for our future episodes. We have some amazing guests coming up. So stay tuned for that. We are so excited to have conversations with, with our guests. So stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. This episode of the Unconventional Diet Podcast is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, Anchor is completely free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm. Oh, mm -hmm.